My name is Dave Zucker. I'm the assistant to the moderator. And I'd like to welcome all of you to the weekly meeting of the College of Complexes, playground for people who think. Um, we have several policies here. First of all, one pool at a time. Second, no personal attacks. All right. Third, third, we will get tuition charged. Three dollars collected from each of us, so that the college may defray its expenses. Four. If we want to continue to meet here, the restaurant has to make some money off of us, and so we might as well get part of yourself some dinner, get yourself something else to eat or and or drink. <laughs> All right. Our format is as follows. First. Will get announcements by our coordinator Charlie Paydock. We'll announce upcoming programs. Then we will open it up for announcements of neighborhood or community interest. And the speaker, Larry Riley, will talk about community renewal for about an hour or so. Then after that, we will have questions and answers. Questions must be in that form, no speeches. This is like Jeopardy. Whenever up with a speech, you'll be absolutely interrupting you with um, what's, your, what's your question. And after that, Tim will all portion out the time. Each person can talk for, uh, for another five minutes or so. And whatever they would like to talk about, we prefer it to the front the speaker. You don't have to, you can talk about whatever you want. And then the speaker will get the last word. We will close the down about a quarter to eight. Okay, Charlie, go ahead. Charlie, start with the upcoming programs. All right, I'll be brief this week. Welcome to meeting number 3708 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, next week, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Uh, something of a college regular. Henry Perez will be talking about ownership of social media, control and censorship of the media is the general topic. So it should be exciting. He was the recipient of the number one prize speaker and the Newberry debates in the, in the park uh, one year or more. So he's a celebrated, pretty good, a celebrated, accomplished speaker. So social media will be the thing. We have two open dates in April, April 8th and 15th, looking for ecological topics. Um, also, I'd like to announce a new program just posted. On March the 25th, <laughs> we will have an open microphone concerning the mayoral election on April the 4th. Looking for one speaker for each candidate. If you'd like to be the keynote speakers, but we're gonna offer five to 10 minutes for each of you to voice your opinion uh, if you for in favor or against uh, the candidates for mayor of the city of Chicago. Okay, Tim, that's about it. Thank you so very much. Take it away. Here's our speaker. All right. Any more announcements? All right. Well, I'd like to introduce now the next speaker, Larry Riley, who will be with us on Zoom. And he's going to talk about community renewal. Give it up, please, for Larry Riley. Okay, Larry. Hey, thank you so much for having me. My name is Larry Dean. Um, it's so great to have you, and thank you for allowing me to do a presentation here. Um, I am the Organizing and Policy Associate for Community Renewal Society. And originally me and my coworker, Karen, were gonna be here, but she's not feeling well. So it's just gonna be me. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation and I think it won't take too long, maybe 30 to 40 minutes and then probably less than that. And then we'll have like the question and answer. So I'm gonna, I don't know if I can um, share my screen. Can I do that? Yes, I can, okay. Screen share, so broadcast. 
Okay, so I'm gonna share um, a PowerPoint that I made to help my presentation. Okay, so um, just to reiterate again, my name is Larry. Um, I am the Organizing and Policy Associate for Community Renewal Society. Um, Community Renewal Society, or CRS as we affectionately call it, um, is an organization that primarily works with faith communities, churches, congregations that want to do um, social justice oriented projects and work. Um, we are based in the state of Illinois, but a lot of our work um, happens in Chicago. And I've been a part of the organization as staff since late 2021. So I've been there a little bit more than a year and I've learned a lot and I hope to you know, grow in this position and give you guys a little snippet of some of the work that we do. So I'm gonna do that. So a little history about the organization. So CRS was started very, very long ago, I think over a hundred years ago. And the founders of the organization um, were originally were lawyers who defended Amistad. Um, there's a, a popular movie about the case of Amistad. He was a slave um, that was brought here in the South who was trying to get legally get his freedom to be in the United States. And the lawyers for that case um, started Community Renewal Society over a hundred years ago. So there's a lot of historical relevance to our work. And, you know, we work a lot with racial justice and social justice issues. And that's because we're historically based and these same things that affect us every day. So we have done a lot of work. CRS has been through a lot of iterations over the years. And currently we're a 501c3. Um, we have an organizing and policy team, a development team, that does communications and we have an executive director, Dr. Walsh Trina Middleton. Um, so currently for me, we are working, I work in Chicago, but some of our staff are based remotely around the country. And like I said, we work with faith communities to do social justice projects. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that we're currently doing that I lead. Um, so yeah, move on here. So, I lead the um, police accountability work and the criminal justice reform work. And when I started, um, it was in the year 2021. And I think a few years before that, um, CRS had been engaged in the consent decree. And the consent decree is a legally binding document where two parties kind of make decisions to, you know, help an institution, help a police department, basically to make some reforms and changes that are necessary. And in 2016, um, Chicago and the Chicago Police Department um, was mandated by the federal government to do a consent decree after the murder um, and killing of Laquan McDonald. Laquan McDonald was a young black boy who was murdered and shot infamously 16 times um, by the Chicago Police Department. And because of that instance and the history of violence and brutality against Black people in Chicago, um, the federal government decided um, and the Chicago Police Department agreed to go into a consent decree. And I think this is in 2016. So in 2019, a few years after the consent decree was established, um, CRS and a few other organizations um, along with lawyers from the ACLU um, decided to file a lawsuit against the city because of the lack of implementation on the consent decree. And under that work, we are in coalition with the groups, um, the Campbell Group, as we're called, that sued the city to make sure that the Chicago Police Department is actually instituting these changes and these police reforms that we think are vital to eliminating and decreasing significantly brutality cases. Um, so over the course of the last two or three years since I've been on, in 2021, we have been working with the ACLU to hold the police department accountable so that we see important changes. Some of those changes that we've seen is the foot pursuit policy. And the foot pursuit policy is basically 
the legal rights that a police officer has to chase up someone on foot. Um, and we revised that that in the consent decree um, because we saw even last year, someone was murdered, a young man, after he was chased on foot by police. Um, so we've changed that um, policy. And another policy in the consent decree that we have worked to change is the use of force, um, which now has clear guidelines around how much force is necessary um, that the police can use on the public. So those are some of an example of some of the ch changes that we want to see in the consent decree. Just recently, we've been talking to the city about um, how police are trained to use force against people with disabilities and that officers should be trained to make sure that they are not hurting people who have disabilities or have mental health challenges. Um, and that's a big thing that we're working on currently right now. Um, over the past few months, every few months there are um, federal trials that sort of report on the progress that the police department is making in the city. Um, and I have spoken publicly sort of to denounce some of the um, lack of effort and the lack of changes that we're seeing within the police department. And we have tried to put a lot of pressure on the federal monitor, on the police department, and on the city as well to hold the police accountable to make sure that these changes are not only instituted, but they're being enforced. Um, and now we're in 2023, so this is like many years after the 2016 consent decree, and we're not there yet in terms of having systemic change within the police department. Um, and there have been a lot of starts and stops and struggles that we have went through in trying to get the consent decree implemented fairly. So that's something that we're still in ongoing progress of trying to change. And we're in conversation with the, the federal monitor of the federal government the city, as well as the ACLU, who are representing us legally about um, getting the consent decree really instituted and making sure those changes are real. Okay. Um, another part of my work that I touched on is criminal justice reform. So under my um, portfolio, I work to um, make sure that our criminal justice reform work is happening and that it is representative of the change that we want to see in the system in the city. Um, I think it was two years ago, uh, we were successful. And when I say we, we're part of a coalition called the Illinois Pretrial Justice Network um, that along with other things wanted to eliminate cash bail. Um, cash bail, the reason we wanted to do that is because um, a lot of times when people are arrested, they have a cash bail that they can pay if they wanna get you know out before their trial starts. Um, but a lot of times people obviously do not have $10,000 or $5,000, whatever the amount is to get themselves out of jail. So they sit in jail kind of indefinitely until their trial starts. Um, and it really affects their economic status. It affects how they can see their family. Um, and not everyone who was arrested is necessarily guilty of a crime. So you're sort of locking up a presumed innocent person for a a, a lot of time, and a lot of times those people are black and brown, they're poor folk, and people do not have the opportunities to get out of um, their situation while they're waiting a trial. Um, and on the other side of that, a lot of people who are white or wealthy have the opportunity to get out of, you know, um, jail because they can afford to, and that's an unfair system. So because of that, we worked with the Illinois, Illinois Pretrial Justice Network um, to get the Pretrial Fairness Act or the Safety Act passed um, the last few years. And that took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of um, convincing. And as we, were, as we were advancing and as it passed a few years ago, there was a lot of um, resistance and a lot of people who were, you know, these were legislators on the South suburbs who are basically like not a fan of this legislation because they're very tough on crime. That is their answers to violence and crime. Um, and we disagreed with that. But there was a lot of misinformation campaigns. It was called the purge law um, and basically was saying the law advocated lawlessness and anarchy and all these things that the law actually doesn't do. So we really, over the last few years, um, combated a misinformation campaign to make sure the Pre-Trial Fairness Act not only was passed, but the actual truth of this law was known widely. Um, and we thought we were successful. We really did. We went to Springfield. CRS took 
some of our members there um, and we talked to legislators about it. And, you know, there was, there was many challenges. There was a trailer bill. There were so many things that were trying to stop this um, Pre-Trial Fairness Act from actually passing. Um, so when it passed, you know, when it was supposed to be implemented January 1st of this year, 2023, we were very excited. Um, but unfortunately, uh, some of the legislators on the South suburbs who were white filed a lawsuit with the um, state government and to stop this bill from being implemented. Um, and originally what happened was uh, the bill would be implemented in counties and territories where the, there was no lawsuit happening and then not implemented in certain places, mainly in the South suburbs, where there was legislation fighting, there was, le there was a lawsuit fighting legislation. Um, but unfortunately that created like, you, you, the law has to apply to the entire state, it can't just be certain places. So because of that, the Pre-Child Fairness Act um, did not go into implementation. Uh, right now it is being discussed in court and there'll be hearings coming up soon um, that'll happen. And that put a dent into our plans, but we're still working with the state's attorney to make sure that the Pre-Child Fairness Act is passed and that the challenges to this um, law are not substantiated. Uh, so we've been working really hard to make sure that uh, this Pre-Child Fairness Act passed because if it does pass, it really will provide a lot of people who are locked up or who are in jail, who are not out of trial yet, the opportunity to live their lives, um, to help them find resources and to not you know, further the prison industrial complex because it's very expensive for our city to incarcerate people before they go to trial. You know, you have to feed them, you have to provide a space for them. And, you know, our prison system and our jail system is over flooding. We do not have the capacity or the money to house all these people essentially in a place where they can't help themselves or we're not actually changing their lives for the better. So it really is, you know, a, a smart financial decision to not to pass this law, but also it is morally right um, it aligns with our faith beliefs to make sure that people, marginalized people, are not presumed guilty or not penalized because they can't afford to get out of jail. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, another point, another part of our work is our economic justice work. Um, we used to have a, a organizer who did economic justice, and we were really focused on reparations as not only a law that could be passed, something that's, you know, we took very seriously, but to educate people around how economic justice is really impacted by um, inequality um, and economic violence and how reparations is, is a way to remedy some of those things. So I didn't work on this myself, but I've always been a proponent of reparations. Um, we sponsored or supported HR 40, which is a national reparations legislative ordinance um, that is still being discussed in committee. Um, but we saw a lot of strides in the fight for reparations, such as um, the reparations ordinance that passed in Evanston, Illinois, giving people um, money for housing and to do home repairs. So we're still um, looking at economic justice and really thinking around how reparations can be implemented and how to educate people around what reparations look like. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit briefly around our faith and action framework. Um, so at CRS, we are very much um, emboldened and impassioned by you know, our, our religion and also the work of God, the spirit, the Bible, all these things that we have like moral impetus to move and work on. And a lot of our work is geared toward helping the most marginalized, helping people who are um, on the margins, like LGBTQ people, people with disabilities, Black people, um, women, just doing things that we think um, God or whoever you work with would approve of and do if they were still in, you know, living human form. And we think our faith really guides us to make decisions and our work is really guided by our faith practices. Um, we have some programming specifically that looks at um, our faith community and like spiritual wellness. Uh, we have something called Reflect, Pray, Act. And it's a series we started uh, late last year and we continue into this year where we take like 30 to 40 minutes of our day, usually in the middle of the day, um, to kind of like reflect on the world and what's happening. Okay, got it. No, no, no. Mike. 
They say the mic. No, no, but this, this, they'll hear you and you'll hear them better. It's made for this. So what I do? That put the, that way. Larry, I accidentally muted you. Can you unmute, please? Sorry about that. Larry, I accidentally unmuted you. My apologies, please. Larry, are you there? We, we, I accidentally muted you. Sorry about that. Yeah, he can see us. I, I just, um, Oh, hey, Larry, I muted you accidentally. Can you unmute real quick? I am sorry about that. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, Larry. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. I'm going to go back to the presentation. I'm sorry about muting you by mistake. We just had another guy. Uh, it was, uh, we had one of our guys had a lot of noise, so my apologies. Okay, no problem. And, uh, don't forget to, to uh... okay, we got it now and go ahead. Okay, yeah, we're, we're all set now. Thank you very much, sir. And I'm sorry about the technical delay. Okay, no problem. I'm sorry, no no issues. Um, so yeah, we, we work to really think about what faith means to us and how that guides some of our principles and what we do. Um, like I was saying, we have a Reflect, Pray, Act. Um, we go to churches, we, we formed faith in action teams in the churches to really activate the community to make sure that like, it's not just the pastor, it's not just the deacons, it's everyone in the com church community that really comes together to do the work. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our, uh, some of the more recent work. So we have a program called My Congregation Votes. And what we wanted to do was really increase the civic engagement uh, work that we do because of course we're in an election year for our municipal election and our mayoral election. So it was really important for us to get people out to vote. So what we did is we talked to faith leaders about how they can use um, their sermons or their newsletters to get as many people as possible to vote in the next election. And we started it um, in November because we have the municipal elections and we're continuing it now and the mayoral elections, even the runoff in mm -hmm. April. So we've been canvassing, we've been getting people to vote, we do phone banking, and we wanna just get the faith community activated in the voting process. Um, so that's been a big part of our work over the last few months is like civic engagement, training mm -hmm. folks up to get their congregations to vote and giving out information so that people feel compelled to vote in the next election coming up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, empowering communities and public safety campaign that we signed on to a few years ago. Um, that's really a big part of our work that we do. So in, I think it was before I came on 2019-ish, um, we had really been working with the Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability. It's a, it's a formation of community groups and nonprofits to really think about how we could reimagine public safety in our city um, and create something that would not only make the police more accountable, but community safer um, and have people being at the table to make decisions about what safety looked like. Um, so in that year, um, with the collaboration of CARPER, which is the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, we passed an ordinance in City Hall um, that essentially created this new um, authoritative body that would oversee police. Um, so it created this, uh, committee called the Chicago Community for Public Safety, CCPSA, um, made up of like lawyers, organizers, young folk, uh, just community leaders um, who would be able to make policies and recommendations toward um, the police department about how we wanted to see change. Um, and that was a big win for us because it took many years to write that policy, to get that passed. It also created what we call the district councils. So district councils are there are three people in each police district in the city um, that will help get community voice. They will also get hold meetings where com the community can come to and talk about public and talk about public safety. 
And they would also have the opportunity to elect who will be in the permanent committee, the TTPSA committee. So we just passed that, and just this coming uh, mayoral, the, the city voted for district councils, and we were able to get um, 66 people who supported um, the ECPS campaign that we trained, that we helped get elected to their first public office. A lot of these people who ran for district councils are Black. They are people who have never held a, a political office before. So this is you know, kind of giving them the power to make those tools and changes within their community. And it was a really successful, wonderful campaign that we were still working on. So the ECPS was a really big thing. Actually, my coworker was a district council person who was elected over the um, last week. So it was it was a great success and it's a great campaign that we're gonna continue to work on. Okay, so my last thing is just to get involved. I'm gonna put some more resources to our website. Um, I, we have our issue area teams. So I lead the police accountability and the criminal justice team. We have a um, team that works on LGBTQIA issues. Um, you can join those teams. I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat and also register to vote. We're still pushing the um, elections. They're coming up and we would love to see more turnout from all communities. Um, so yeah, that kind of concludes my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just uh, thank everyone for listening to me and CRS, we're here to give voice to people to help people out, to get people more engaged. And yeah, thank you. So I think we can do questions now. People have questions about CRS. All right, thank you. All right, we got questions for you guys. You wanna, anybody got questions for this guy? Okay, uh, who's got questions? Charlie, Norma, Raj, Charles? Yeah, uh, go ahead, Charlie. There's been community boards such as public transit and so forth, and they haven't really generated any kind of like change or reform. Uh, and I hate to damper your new actions, but uh, do you, how much do you, do you, how much do you believe that these new councils are really going to bring about change? Yeah, that's a good question. And thank you for that, Charles. Um, you know, as someone who, so I've worked in police accountability for many years, even before I got this job, I, I'm part of a major organization called Black Youth Project 100, and we've done a lot of work um, around police accountability, criminal justice reform. And I've seen a lot of, you know, things like this, like I've seen COPA, I've seen IPRA, I've seen a lot of iterations of this. And I have always, you know, said that, you know, I'm so, outside of CRS, Larry, just as a person, you know, I believe in abolition. I don't think we're going to win by just reforming the system. I think we need to overhaul the system. But, you know, as CRS employee, um, I think that although I agree that they're, they're, the ordinance does not go far enough, I think we have to start somewhere. There has to be some form of engagement. And I think, you know, it's not perfect. And there, it, is, it'll be, it has been and it will be difficult for district councils to make change. I do think that having more people who are at the table, who get to make the decisions, will help shift a little bit of power. It may not shift the narrative, it may not change the entire police department, but I think that everyone who was elected in her district council, majority of the people actually are invested in their community and actually like know what's going on. And to have people who are on the ground, who are impartial, who can speak to not only police, but speak to their community members, actually have a vote and a say in city council, I think what it will do is make new leaders who are more empowered. It'll make more diverse leaders. I think it will give people the opportunity to learn about like policymaking and criminal justice reform. And it, 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 I don't think it'll change the system, but I think it's a, it's a closer step to what we should be doing. It's a better step to holding police accountable and making change. It's not gonna do everything. It doesn't do everything and no policy is perfect. But I think where this ordinance gets it right is we have more of a say than we have before. And other iterations like this and COPA, those are all elected by the mayor. Like they just choose whoever they want. And at least in this process, 
people actually voted for someone that they may have supported, that they researched on to represent their community. And it's not just someone who they have no affiliation to, who's making decisions about what the safety looks like. So I think that we're, what ECPS gets right is that it puts a lot more electoral power in the public's hand to say what safety looks like. But I agree with you that like, it's, you know, it's not perfect. It's, it's, there's gonna be mistakes and we're learning too as we make go along. Thank you. Okay, uh, who's next on the questions? Who's next? Go ahead. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, let me get him in here. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Okay, there we go. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, do you believe, um, do you hold to the definition of racism as prejudice plus power? Are, are you asking me what, what I believe the definition of racism means? Do you believe that the definition of racism is prejudice plus power? Yeah. Um, no, I should know this. I feel like, um, yeah, I think definitely for sure, prejudice and power are components of racism for sure. Like that's definitely something that has, but I think that, you know, when I think of racism and what that means, I definitely think of like systemic violence, I think of, of centuries, not just like individuals' prejudices or people's like discrimination. I think of like the way that like the housing crisis and, um, the, the, even the pandemic that I, we saw so much more how uh, Black communities and Brown communities had higher rates of mortality and did not have access to the vaccine as easy as other communities. Um, and I think of racism in terms of these systemic problems that are global, like not even just American issues, they're global issues. Um, and, and it's a system that's really it's so difficult to define because it's so broad, but yet we have to define it in order to make decisions, in order to like make policy changes. So it's like, yeah, we have prejudice and power, but we also have like colonialism. Like we have the history of slavery and like, and modern violence too. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot to even think about what, what we would call racism, which it has so much different versions and different aspects to it that have to be addressed. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow up. All right, I'm gonna follow up on your question. Um, when, when you believe in racism, is it just white on black or whites discriminated against blacks or can you find instances of reverse racism and me being a white guy, is there anything I do right? See, that's a loaded question. These are, these are loaded questions. Y'all are y'all putting me on the spot. Um, I think, I think, like people can be discriminatory, definitely. Like, and there's a lot of different ver like things in terms of what you know stereotypes of people. There's like bullying of people. There's that happens to everyone. I think. Um, and I think for white people, I think what white people could do um, is be better, I think, at stepping up when you see something wrong, when you know something is wrong, and talking to your, your community, talking to your neighbors, talking to your um, families, but also, you know, looking inward and saying instances where you may have, you know, thought, you know, a negative stereotype about someone, or it takes a lot of internal work that I think white people must do so that they understand that like, even with the best intentions, like there's still work that has to be done so that you you are an ally and are not only an ally, but a um, an adversary, someone who will be on the front lines with people of color and black people to really um, fight for like, you know, the right things. Um, and I'm learning that racism and also the homophobia and all those other things. I think it's something that white people a lot of times don't have the language for and they're not taught that in school. So like, 
they're adults and they don't know how to have these kind of conversations necessarily. But I think that white people can, there's a lot, there's a lot of books you can read. There's a lot of, you know, things you can do, but I think it's an active choice. You have to make an active choice to unlearn racism. And it might be difficult. It might be hard. It might alienate people. Um, but it's, you know, an individual decision. And I don't think it's like, I mean, whatever my feelings of white people are doesn't matter because it's a system that protects them. But I think there's work. There's a lot of work that white people could be and should be doing to make the world better for people of color. And I think, and I think we're regressing. I think I would like to see white people. I think just with the last few years with Trump and the alt-right and the far right and like the proliferation of that ideology being way more popular, I think we white people have not done enough. And there's a lot of ways that they need to step up to change some of that. Okay, we're gonna follow up here. So okay. go ahead. Yeah, I have a follow up. Um, the podcaster and Dilbert cartoonist Scott Adams got into some big trouble for comments he made about not wanting to help black people anymore. And he considers black people a hate group and, and this kind of thing. And that was based on a Rasmussen poll where like the upper 40% uh, couldn't agree that it's okay to be white. So my question to you is, um, is there anything that the black community can do to address their own racism towards whites such that nearly half of them don't think it's okay to be white? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, <sighs> how y'all give me these questions today? Yeah. I think uh, as a black person, um, I don't think it is black people's responsibility to fix racism or the feelings of white people that are that when white people feel bad or feel discriminated against or hurt. I don't think it's black people's responsibility to address or you know take care of that. I think that if white people feel discriminated against or that they're the targets of racism, it shows me that they haven't done the internal work um, to really look at what racism is and have centered their own feelings in a place where they their feelings are more bigger than the actual facts of society. And I think because we're in a very individualistic society where it's about me, 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 white people have not been able to internal, they, they haven't been able to look outside of themselves because their feelings are more centered than the realities of what black people actually go through. I was reading a, um, a piece today, a really good piece about um, the, the election and Paul Vallis and his rise and how he won. And he, you know, talked a lot about crime and that's been a, a big issue in the election. And what the piece was talking about was that white people are less likely to be victims of crime than anyone else in the city, but they feel that crime is the number one issue for them, even though if a black people have much higher rates of being victims of crimes, but white people feel that is a huge issue for them, even though statistically it's not. And that's an example of white people centering themselves when they're actually not at the center of that problem. And I think that's what I see a lot is white people feeling like, because I feel hurt, and discriminated against, that means that Black people should be doing something to remedy that. And I think that doesn't able to like show the fact that like Black people are more likely than anyone else to be victims of police violence. They have less access to education. Even when they have education, they have lower job prospects and opportunities due to employment discrimination. They're the most incarcerated in this country. So a white person saying the Black community should be doing something doesn't make sense when white people have benefited, have enacted extreme amounts of violence that has never been remedied in this country. We do not have reparations. We have, we do not, they, there's not an equal system in this country. So before I can care for what white people feel, black people's material conditions have to improve greatly. Um, and I don't think a white person who is committed to um, equality and advancing justice would have a problem with that. They would understand that. So yeah, I don't think it is a black community's responsibility to care for the feelings of white people when white people are like harming black people at a very large scale globally. Uh, can I, can yeah, I go I ahead, Roger, next question. Uh, 
Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't understand, Larry, what you are saying, but um, there are black people who are very well off, and there is a big black middle class, and there are lots of poor white people who are poorer than than black people, and uh, so they had. They, they are the one who are the taking brunt of black violence if at all it happens. And so so do you guys ever consider that there are there are poor black white people and, and they they have fear. And so part of your responsibility is how to how to get how to create an atmosphere that white people don't fear you. Mm -hmm. white, don't, white people don't fear black people. Yeah, so I'm gonna to respond to some of that. Um, so when we talk about economic stability in the black middle class, um, what we can look at is that the black middle class, like it does not compare to the, the, the wealth that white people have in the country. And, you know, th there's a lot of facts that I can talk about. I'm not gonna get into all of that, but I just know because th that's just, there's a lot, there's a lot to that. And I think that white people having a fear of black people doesn't make sense when white people have been incredibly violent, like in terms of slavery, in terms of economic violence, in terms of police brutality, like there's been a lot of white violence that has been accepted and okay and patriotized. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. I think the fear that you know some whites will have is based off of their own racist ideas. Um, that have, you know, been shown to the media, to the political system. They've been taught and fed a lot of racist tropes and violence, storylines. But um, there's actual, we can see white people enacting violence, not only in America, but all over the world via the American militarized system. But back to like economics, it's like, there's still, a, even in Chicago, just thinking about Chicago, like, think about like the, um, like the, what is the word I'm looking for? Segregation of, of Chicago and, and the segregation of communities. And if you look at the South and West sides and some of the issues that go on there, it's really a policy decision. And when I say policy, I'm talking about school closures. I'm talking about transportation systems that are not done. I'm talking about the violence that is an overbloated police budget. Um, and we see that enacted so much on our black communities. So if we're talking about the black middle class and opportunity, I don't think you can say that when we are we're still worried about very real violence in our communities. That is really the product of disinvestment and the product of bad policymaking and anti-blackness. And I think that a lot of times you look at like Barack Obama or people in power and black people who are have a mass wealth and fame as like black people have made it, they've got it, they've got opportunities, but the majority of black people are suffering in this city and in this country. Um, and a lot of it is because white people historically and currently have enacted violence on those communities through disinvestment, through police brutality and through the taking of resources. So there's a lot, it's a complicated question. I know this is like, you know, a certain kind of space, but I think to really push back on the idea that black people are wealthy and have a lot of money. No, 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 no. Larry, Larry, wait a minute, wait a minute, okay? Most of the violence is black on black. There, there is no, not that many violence on black on white. Most mm -hmm. of the violence is there, but black people are afraid of black people. And black people are, whose kids are killed and uh, whose spouses are killed and who are being victim of black, they are against you guys. And the, the, the black community is more stronger against the violence and crime by black people, not the mm -hmm. white people. Well, even the talk, term black and black. When I talk to black okay. people, they're afraid, mm -hmm. they're afraid you guys. I talk to black people, they're afraid in their own community, they're afraid. The kids are being killed sitting in their own home. Okay, and there is a problem. And you guys talk to them, talk to the, your same black community. Hey, stop violence, okay? There is a stop killing black people, stop hurting black people. And when white people see that black people are scared of black people, hey, what are you, what are you advising to white people? 
Why not talk to, why not go and talk to them, black people? They don't, don't be afraid of us, but they are afraid. Do you talk to, do you talk within community? Okay. Why right. don't we do we got to move on. Okay, Charlie, you're next. You got a question? Yes, Larry. Um, decades ago, right out of college, I took a job just like yours. We had something called the Office of Economic Opportunity in the federal government. And we were going to create a great society. And we were engaged in a war on poverty. But obviously, you seem to think that we didn't succeed. Why do you think, and you mentioned some other programs, what is Larry's plan for a war on poverty? What is your plan mm -hmm. to really get rid of it once and for all and so that people have their basic <coughs> human needs met without fear of where the next, you know, they get one paycheck and it, they're desperate. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, ugh, again, another complicated like question that does not have a simple answer. But um, I think that what we've seen, you know, over the last few years, um, is a lot of American greed and capitalism in terms of the hoarding of resources and wealth. Um, and even I know, you know, we talked about America being the most, you know, advanced and the most free and having opportunities. I think. So much labor is dependent upon slave labor and low wage work and not giving people opportunities. And I think there's, I don't have the answer to, to win the war on poverty, but I think what we could be doing for sure is creating housing for folks and not have housing. We need to really have rent control um, and lowering the price of housing for everyone. I think that's something that everyone could and should get behind. Um, and I think we really need to make education free for everyone. I think the education system is so much privilege towards people who live in nice suburban communities or have resources already. And I think for black folks who are going through a lot in this country, um, that, that seems like the only way, but like we're drowning in college debt, we're drowning in you know, the extreme cost of attending college. So I think we, that would be, I would love to see in my lifetime college be made free, all of college be made free, um, not just community colleges, I think that would help for sure. And I think for sure, reparations, like I'm a moment of reparations of cash payments. I think black people are owed for our labor in this country and we have not been given that. And I think we've seen through the prison industrial complex, through all types of things that we are not being given economic security or status in this country. So I'm all for reparations. I think we definitely need direct cash payments. And I know that's a controversial take, but that's what I believe. Okay, um, what has your organization done uh, in this area of racism? So we have done, so part of my work is a lot of criminal justice reform. And I talked about previously us, you know, working to pass the Safety Act, working to pass the ECPS coalition. All this work is based off of what we now know is a racist criminal justice system, like more black people are incarcerated than anyone else. And, you know, against popular belief, we are not more violent. We don't kill more Black people. We are not more than anyone else in this country that is equally violent. And, but we are locked up for the most and the harshest and longest crimes. So our work around ra ending racism is a lot about destroying and dismantling the criminal justice system because so many people are tied up in that. And when they're in there for a long time, they can't make money, they can't get jobs, they can't go to school and their families also suffer too. And it creates a wealth of trauma and a wealth, a cycle of violence. So in order to really, you know, like we said, equal the playing field and get more black people opportunities to, you know, empower their community, we definitely need to get more of them out of jail and out of prison because they're not doing anything there. They're not learning there. Um, and there's so much that they could be doing if they were not held up in a system that is unfair, that does not treat everyone the same way. Um, so I think ending racism definitely starts with dismantling the criminal justice system. And then on next to that, like I said, we do economic justice, but we also fight for um, LGBTQ and queer folk. A lot of black queer folk you know, have higher rates of suicide, have higher rates of violence. And we know that like, in order for black people to have the freedom, queer and trans people yeah. also need to have the freedom to um, have full and, and wonderful well-rounded lives. So we are invested in 
are making sure that Black queer people have the opportunities to really thrive in this society. Okay, we, uh, we're gonna take some questions from the floor here, but I just like to get your views on what's called the 1619 Project. Mm -hmm. You know what that is? Yeah, I do. I, I read it and I watched it and I'm a big fan of Nicole Hannah Jones and the work she's doing. And just seeing, you know, I think part of the popularity of the 1619 Project is the reason we're seeing so much uh, rolling back of African-American history in our schools and a lot of like people attacking that history because we see that it has real world impacts. Like if we educate more people on what happens, like we can't run from the, the reparations argument. We can't run from the ills of the criminal justice system because this lays out the history of that around the country. So you see like in Florida, people saying to not talk about it because people don't want to be accountable towards, like we talked about the work of white people. They don't want to see what they've done in this country to make it look like what it does. So what would be like your views of Trump and uh, DeSantis and what they're doing? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, they represent a very large part of our country about, you know, and it's not just, you know, about racism, because we've talked a lot about racism, but it's also around misogyny and taking away reproductive rights from women. It's also around um, transphobia, like not giving trans people the access to healthcare. It's racism, it's misogyny, it's sexism, it's violence. And I think a lot of people, a lot of white people are supportive of that because they feel that they're losing this country and that other people are getting rights. And because you know what white people have done is enacted violence. Mm -hmm. So I think that their popularity is really speaking to, I think the progression of people of color in this country and the, the, the backlash against that and the wanting to, you know, have a white majority in this country to look one way. And I think that, um, you know, there's so much we could talk about with the far right and the GOP party, but I think that it, it, it's a lot. And I think that, like we said, we need to have white people be stronger to combat that because that is something that's very real. And the, and the, and, and the right has definitely like pushed farther right than what they've been, even farther than what they've done. So they have very real consequences for people. Okay, uh, you guys got questions in the uh, audience at all? All right. all right, I'm gonna go back here to, uh, to our guy. Now speak loud if you can, please, because we're gonna try to pick you up. Go ahead. Uh, this guy, speak loud. Okay, on the reparations, who's gonna pay for it? Yeah, so, you know, for as far as reparations, um, we spend billions of dollars on our police system every year. We spend billions of dollars on wars abroad, like the war in Ukraine. We spend billions of dollars to bomb Middle Eastern countries like Syria and, and Palestine. And it would be great for white people to decide we don't need to kill more people of color. And instead of that, we're going to give people reparations. So I think we can take all the money that we've spent giving to Ukraine and the billions and actually give to people of color and black people to help them live better lives. So I think we should cut that military budget. Okay, uh, Ellen, you want to, you've got a question for him? Go ahead, loud please. Hi, I'm sorry I was late. I was over at the debate uh, between Brandon Johnson and Paul Dallas. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about Brandon Johnson and um, how, Remind me, so that's why we were late. You're with that community organization, and how do you interface? Would you be supporting Brandon Johnson, and maybe we could all work together on this? Yeah, so CRS, we're a 501c3, so we don't support candidates. Um, but we, we do support people who are great on the issue. So we care about housing. We care about, um, like we said, reproductive rights. Um, someone, and I think there's definitely someone I'm supporting. I'm not going to say who it is, but I think there's an obvious choice that's more successful, that cares more about our communities, um, who's a great organizer and former teacher. So, yeah, but we don't endorse people because we're like a nonprofit. That's a problem. How are you organized? Uh, just, you've been around a long time. This group, right? The yeah, yeah, I've been around, but CRS has been around for years and years, many decades. Community renewal society. Community renewal society. How long has that been around? Yeah, since hundreds of years, since many years, since um, very long time, hundreds of years. Yeah. Okay. We got a follow up over here. Um, 
Go ahead. Yeah, so it, you didn't really answer my question when I asked about Scott Adams and uh, that Rasmussen poll where nearly half of black people couldn't agree with the idea that it's okay to be white. And one of the things you said is, you know, like, I'm paraphrasing, but one of the things you said was like, oh, you know, we can't worry about the feelings of white people. It's not the responsibility of black people to help the feelings of white people or whatever, whatever. I didn't mention anything about feelings at all. I didn't mention my feelings or anybody else's. I just noted a brute fact as expressed in the Rasmussen poll that nearly half of black people can't bring themselves to agree with the idea that it's okay to be white. So my question to you is, I'll pose it one more time. Hopefully you'll be able to answer it. My question is, do you think that's a problem that black people need to be addressed, that black people need to address that nearly half of them can't bring themselves to say that it's okay to be white? How about a white Nazi? Yeah, I don't think it's a problem that black people think it's not okay to be white. It's not. We have bigger problems. That seems like a very small, insignificant problem to me. Good to know. So if there's a poll for white people who think that it's not okay to be black, I, I will look forward to your consistency in believing that that's also a small problem. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, all right. Who's next on the uh, questions? Come on, guys. We got it. We, we, we got it here. Um, what? Uh, Be I got a question. Go ahead, Charlie. So please ask it. Yeah, Larry, a lot of people like uh, Tim tell us all the time how wonderful it is in the suburbs. And why should they care about problems in the city? What do you think about that kind of position? I think, you know, and it's interesting because in the south suburbs in, in Illinois, um, over the last few years, you've seen a lot of like white flight. So you've seen black people and people of color move to suburbs because essentially they're being pushed out of the city because they can't afford it, um, specifically families. So I think, you know, especially in, in Illinois, you've seen a lot, the issues that, you know, happen in the city definitely go over into the suburbs because those same people in the city are going to the suburbs, moving there because like it's cheaper to live. Um, and I think those, when we talk about crime and violence, definitely, and also economic issues, you see, like in Dalton and Riverdale and a lot of um, these places where job opportunities are waning and there's less um, economic infrastructure, um, you see a lot of these same issues kind of repopulated in different ways. Um, so I think it's, it's short-sighted to think that as someone who lives in the suburb that you're not gonna like live next to a black person or you're not gonna encounter a certain situation because you live in a suburban community. All these issues are interconnected and you may not feel it right now, but you'll feel the economic issues that Chicago goes through or the, the violent issues that Chicago has, you'll feel it, but it won't, it may not immediately happen to you. Um, and I think that hopefully people see, you know, their community is not just around who you live around, but like the, the world, the global community that you're a part of to make change or resistance happen. Did you hear that, Tim? <laughs> Yeah, I heard it, Charlie. And the thing is, I still, I'm up for suburban living. You don't have the taxes, particularly on cigarettes, where, where a black family would have to pay twice as much as they do in the city of Chicago. You don't have the uh, towing companies that are going around getting the cars out. You don't have all the damn local ordinances where you have to put up with the stuff, and you don't have to deal with a large bureaucracy at City Hall. You usually got a small town to take care of, and they usually can leave you alone if yeah. they're a little bit out of the norm. Anyway, yeah, I, I think, oh, this one else say something. Yeah, I think, you know, so I, I grew up in a suburb, I think in Seattle on the West Coast, which is very different politically than um, Chicago is or Illinois. But um, I think sometimes, sort of the benefits are, of living in the city is being closer to resources. So, you know, I was very lucky to grow up and to have like, you know, my two parents and a car and like access to things. But I think for a lot of people like in Chicago, I don't have a car. Um, and I imagine if I lived in uh, 
a suburban community how difficult it will be to like go to the pharmacy or go to work every day or go to the hospital if need be like how would i will there be public transportation infrastructure to help me so a lot of those things that like a lot of poor people or black people rely on those public assistance um made me have more widespread in the city so that might be a benefit to people who live there um and as far as the high taxes it's like you know, the goal, I think, when I think about, like, the taxes, like, hopefully those taxes are going to, like, improve the schools, are going to improve our roads and, like, doing all of that. So there's a reason, and Chicago, and Chicago has really high taxes, um, and we definitely need to see better, like, use of the taxes. So I agree with you, taxes are not not great, but um, the reason that we want the high taxes, if they want them, is to be able to, like, give people more healthcare and Medicare and all those resources that we need to have safer and better communities. Are you, okay, I'm just gonna, are you familiar with uh, other countries and their systems of, uh, um, you know, with racism and politics and healthcare? Uh, could you compare and contrast if you know anything about other countries? Yeah, so recently I was supposed to um, visit Cuba with has a socialist kind of uh, country. And Cuba has a really complicated history with the US as there's an embargo, or there was an embargo, there isn't anymore, but there was an embargo on Cuba where they couldn't get, they couldn't trade goods with the US because of like political history and fighting and all that stuff. Um, and when Biden was elected, he took that embargo away, which was great. But because of that, there was a lot of um, economic issues in Cuba. Um, a lot of poverty throughout Cuba. Uh, but what Cuba does very well is they have an amazing healthcare system where they have doctors who go kind of door to door and check on you and you have better access to, and it actually helps. Like they did a great job with COVID and getting the vaccine to more people because they didn't have to leave their home. And to contrast that and compare that with America where we have a privatized healthcare system mostly and it's very expensive to get healthcare if you don't have a job or health insurance. Um, and even with that, you have high premiums, you have co-pays, um, and we actually, we have higher death rates. We have, you know, more people who are going ill and more people who like need healthcare. Um, and Cuba, which is a socialist country, is doing a much better job. So I think there's lessons we can take from other countries that are like doing things better. Um, and our health system is like, it's crumbling. We're seeing people fall out of the nursing profession. profession. Uh, people, we don't have any space at ERs, like where we can do so much better. And I think one of the things, of course, is not tying your employment to whether you can or cannot get healthcare. So that's definitely something that we can learn from Cuba specifically around socializing uh, and not privatizing our healthcare system. Okay, uh, Justin Tucker, you got your hand up and uh, let's see you for once. Um, so how do you know, uh, so you mentioned Cuba as having better health care than the United States. How do you know that to be true? Well, because I've studied this, I actually was going to go to Cuba. I was in a whole program to learn about it. So like, it's not something I'm just making up. Like I know that. And also I live in America and I do, our, I'm working in our healthcare system. I have, I'm diabetic. So I go to the doctor many times and I, and it's, the price of insulin is ridiculous. So I know that because I use insulin. So I know when the price goes up and I know when that happens. And I've seen people and I've talked to people who are Cubans or native Cubans and who travel to Cuba to, Cuba to do a lot of organizing work that their system is a lot better. So, and also we see the high rate of death that we had in America from COVID that was all over the world, but actually Cuba had a lower rate of death. So we think about why is that when we have more resources allegedly than Cuba does. So I've done research and I'm actually American. So like, I know that our healthcare system doesn't work. So yeah, that's, that's how I know. Okay, Raj, you got a question yeah. now, go uh, ahead. Larry, are you sure you are more, you are not more communist uh, or socialist rather than uh, more black and you are worried about uh, social equality or uh, economic equality rather than uh, racial and uh, citizenship equality? Mm -hmm. Well, I think all those are connected. So racial inequality, economic inequality are, especially in America, tied together because like our racial system is definitely, 
you know, impacted by our capitalist system, right? So like when we have, we think about slave, slave labor, which is like something long time ago, slavery, and how, you know, people were forced into doing work. But then we have the low wage system that we have today where a lot of black and brown people and definitely more brown immigrants who are coming to this country, our farmers are, you know, not being paid. We see a lot of sexual violence with people who come to this country who are immigrants. So all these cycles of slavery, of low wage, of capitalism, it's all a circle and it just, it goes round and round and it's interconnected. So my fight against racism and racist society is connected to my fight against economic inequality. And all those things are really dependent upon each other to make systemic change, to make change that not only affects me, but affects people in my community and around the country and the world. So I think you can't divorce the, the fight against you know violence, economic violence and the fight against you know racist and violence. They're both very interconnected to each other. Okay, Justin, let's uh, go next there. If you got something to say, with it, give her another question. Yes. So uh, you said that capitalism and slavery and all these systems of oppression are interlocked. Um, can you uh, can you reconcile that with the political oppression that had gone on in Cuba, where dissidents to this day are uh, taken to, you know, forced labor camps, or even you can even look at other countries other than Cuba, uh, where, you know, countries that were explicitly anti-capitalist had very atrocious uh, human rights records. Can, can you uh, explain how socialism uh, is better than capitalism in that regard, taking into account the entire history of when socialist ideas have been implemented? Yeah, um, I would say that like, true, like definitely in Cuba and other socialist countries that there is still a lot of um, poverty um, and violence that happens. But I think that still doesn't rationalize the violence that happens under American and global capitalism really. Um, and I think, you know, I still, I'm still learning. I'm not like, yay, I'm a socialist. I still have some issues with socialism, but I, I think Che Guevara that who was, Che Guevara, who, who helped uh, Castro overthrow Cuba, he was explicitly an anti-homosexual, you know, he was against homosexuals and, uh, you know, uh, thought that that was like bourgeois excess and, and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. So Cuba's got a really bad uh, oh, come on. record on, on LGBT rights. As does America, as does America, they say the same thing. Well, saying America's got bad, uh, rights doesn't mean that Cuba's uh, record on rights is any work, you know, better. Right. We're, we're that's, all called, that's a that's a that's a logical fallacy. It's a what aboutism. But we're both homo they're both homophobic countries. I'm sorry. They're both both have homophobic countries and people in power who are homophobic. No. Okay. All right. Well, let's fight homophobia. I don't think so. You're you're proving that that systems of oppression are not have nothing. You know, it, the economic. Uh, economic um structure ha has no bearing on if the people are are racist or anti lgbt or not i mean the 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 uh um you know communist countries have also had records of oppressing racial minority groups yeah. Um, so I, I, don't, I, I don't quite understand how, how you can make this claim that capitalism is, you know, uh, yeah, or that socialism would be even better. Yeah. So part of, part of kind of like my ideology is that, you know, regardless of your economic theory and your economic background, we still need to learn anti-Blackness and homophobia and transphobia. Like those things are not, you know, null and void because you're a socialist. So I think regardless of what other economic system you live under, we still live under an anti-Black, a homophobic, a racist society because of white violence around the world. So those things are things that definitely America and Cuba and many other countries need to reckon with and contend with is anti-Blackness and homophobia. Those are things that everyone can unlearn and needs to. Okay, we got another question from the audience here. I have to leave soon too, so please, only a few more questions. All right, well, we're gonna go a little bit more. I got one more from our audience members. Go ahead. Uh, um, 
Wow. Thank you for your uh, presentation. I'm very inspired by your organization and the work it does. Um, the church I belong to, every Sunday, we read a list of names of um, people who have been uh, uh, killed by violence every single Sunday. And it's uh, you killed in the top 20 people. And um, I, you know, it seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong or if I'm biased, but it seems to me that most of the violence uh, um, is uh, black, young black men in, in groups committing violence against other, uh, other blacks. And I'm just wondering if that's true. And um, it seems like an intractable pro uh, uh, problem. What 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 do you think can be done? It's a horrible, horrific situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I think that a few things. One, I think the way that we talk about Black people and is very like offensive to me. It's offensive because I think we talk about them as if they're not people. We talk about them as if like it, it, they're just problems. And I think that's 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 also uh, how white people think, right? Like they don't, they're, the media says there's Chicago so violent, black community so violent, black on black violence, and you internalize that. And that actually affects how you think about all black people. So that's one. Two, I think that in terms of when we think around this concept of black on black violence, which is racist because we don't talk about white on white violence, but put that to the side, black on black violence is like, it is a product of years of disinvestment in our communities. When you have communities that for centuries, and spe in Chicago specifically, like housing covenants where white people would not rent to people of color violently, they wouldn't do that. When we think around school closures, we had the largest school closure in history in the country in Chicago. When you think about the violence of the police budget that is large and huge. Um, and then you and then you whittle that down to like its most basic form, then you get what I guess you would call black on black violence. But that is a small picture of a much bigger picture, which is disinvestment um, from our communities. It's anti-blackness and the sentiments that we think about. It is black people who may not have opportunities, who are poor whose families were poor and whose other families and their parents were poor who don't have economic opportunities. It's lots of things. And for it to be like, okay, we need to fix black people killing each other. Yes, that, like that is something we need to think about, but also as white people who, like I said, are even the least vulnerable to that type of violence. Um, I think you need to think about it systemically and not just this, Fox News media coverage is very sensationalized media portrayal of violence that's, in my opinion, very attractive to white people because a lot of stuff, I think that's a, that's a simplistic way to view it. And to think about it as just these instances of violence separated from school, mass school closures, economic insecurities, healthcare disparities, all types of issues. When you talk about that, you have to talk about that too. You can't just say, Black people are killing each other. No, Black people are being affected by the violence, the economic violence, the systemic violence that's happening in their communities, and they're going the last resort. They don't, they don't value that because everyone around them does, also does not value their life. So it's a larger conversation, and I think the crime conversation, because it's reduced to sound bites and points, really is like not something that white people understand fully. And I think it's very unfortunate that you know we need to educate white people more on why saying that term black on black violence is is not only wrong for a lot of reasons but inappropriate and offensive and doesn't actually get to the root of that problem okay justin go ahead thank you that was a great answer all right justin go ahead so um there's this recent poll it's a couple years old now so i don't imagine much has changed but it, it basically polled the black community in america about their attitudes on the police. And what it found out is at least 50% of, of respondents said that they want to see, you know, the police reformed and this and that, but they want to keep 
the police levels at the same. And then I think it was another uh, 30% said that, yes, we want reforms and everything, but we want more police presence. And then, which that means about 80% of the black respondents said that they want police uh, or more police. So do you think that um, maybe that uh, that there's kind of a disconnect between messaging of like, you know, of what attitudes of what black folks really want regarding to police and then some of this like, you know, defund the police or abolish the police or or things like that. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, um, I think like black people were not a monolith. Like everyone's not going to agree. We're not gonna come to the same conclusions. Like the black community is not like a group of people. Like it's so many different people you know, in this country, and I don't, we're not going to have the same ideas around how to make our community safer. It's just not realistic. But I think that, you know, for me and what I've seen, I understand that like policing in this country started from slave patrols. That was the whole point of policing to catch freed slaves. And we've seen throughout time, um, police in one way or another, always come back to that, catching Black folks, killing Black folks. And for me, I, I have not seen in my lifetime what safety, I haven't seen the use of police outside of that. I have not felt protected. I have not felt served. And I don't know what the other purpose is because I think I've seen that whole thing. Now, granted, there are a lot of Black police officers in this city, There's a lot of Black people who support police, who want more policing in their communities um, because of intra-community violence and things like that. Um, but in, in, in the city, in this city and a lot of urban cities across the country, you see the explosion of not only more money for police and militarized police, but always with that, you see a divestment in education. And in almost every city in this country, you see more money taking out of public education and healthcare. And it always seems to, you know, go towards police because people are scared of crime. Crime is, excuse me, crime is going on, more violent crimes. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't have the answers. And I know that we all don't agree, but I know that like, for me, I have not ever felt safe with police. I've not seen what, you know, a good police department is. So I don't know. I don't have the exact answers. You need to come to Algonquin sometime. Yet you're going to see a good police department. All right, Charlie, that you're next. Hey, come on, me. Oh, Raj, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, were you, you, I don't know if you had your hand up, but if, I'll, let, yeah. I'll let Raj go first and then Charlie. Go ahead, uh, Raj. Larry, do, do you know Maria had done a 49th ward? Uh, she got reelected with 75% of the votes mm -hmm. on the north side. And I think she's doing an excellent job. Okay. And she is not complaining. She is just uh, going, doing her job. And she's doing a lot better job than most of the elder men. What do you say about that? That there is a way. And Maria Hedden is showing the way. Yeah, I actually um, actually know Maria Haddon. I actually live in her ward and I know her personally. And I think she's doing a great job. And I don't agree on everything she does, but I think she she definitely has a good perspective and she definitely understands um, the abolitionist perspective to public safety. So I think she's great. I voted for her. All right, Charlie, go ahead. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Charlie, you got your hand up. The, Larry, the Republican Party has taken almost an adversarial position towards rendering any change or assistance to minority communities in the United States. Uh, there, for example, I think there was one black person who was who attended all of any of the Trump rallies for president, yet significant numbers of people choose to vote Republican assiduously. Uh, is there anything you think that can be done about this rather discouraging uh, fact? Yeah, I think, and I have to leave soon, I have to preface that. Um, 
a lot of people of color vote Republican. A lot of people of color around the country, um, not just white folks, um, are, you know, vote in a lot of people in Florida, a lot of people in the South um, who are not white, who are people of color, Black people, Latinx, Asian folks vote Republican. And I think some of the reason for that is they see a lot of there's this idea of this model minority, right? And I think it affects a lot of Black folks, but Asian Asian folks a lot too, of like, if you get to a certain level, you have the equal rights of white people because you have a house, you have a good job, you've achieved white success in America. So along with that thinking, you you decide, you separate from your, your race, right? Because, you know, immigrants, they're bad. Latinx people are bad. Black people are killing each other. They're criminal. <laughs> And you you take on sort of the the media messaging that the right has, and I think in America it's very attractive to people because I think a lot of people who are indoctrinated into capitalism have a me me better than other people. Like we're at the top, you're at the bottom, and that's something that people like to do because I think it gives people a sense of power and a sense of self. And especially when you are a minority, when you when you have felt left out all the time, and you are finally in a place where you have a positive image of yourself that, you know, in America, it's usually predicated on some level of discrimination against someone else. So I think then you, you know, Black people are easy targets, gay people are easy targets. And you think I've assimilated into whiteness, into the white Republican Party. Now I have to, you know, go against Black rights and queer rights. Um, and for a lot of people, that's that's what is attractive to a lot of people of color, is being able to vote like white people and be like white people. Um, and I think, whiteness as this social construct, as this social achievement in society really has to die for people to love themselves. Cause it's not even just like a political ideology, but it's actually like a self, like looking like white people, speaking like white people, doing things that they like having to literally move yourself and change yourself to a white person to feel accepted. I think it's a really a deep philosophical, philosophical and psychological question that a lot of people of color have to contend with. And I think because of the social benefits that they feel that they get, they, they, they're attracted to that Republicanness because they want to be part of patriotism in America. They want to be included in this exclusive club. So there's a lot of deep rooted issues that a lot of people have psychologically they have to deal with in order to break away from um, this really far right rhetoric that's really popular. And, and also think about misinformation like YouTube and social media and, and having access to everyone's opinion also means you're indoctrinated into that as well. So you see a lot of far right media being legitimized like Donald Trump being president, Ron DeSantis going on The View. You see a lot of far right ideology being normalized and you, you internally start normalizing it within yourself. So there's the media is a big, issue too with that too okay uh who else has a yeah oh you've got one more hey tim your guest has repeatedly said he's got to go so maybe, all right uh, well if you if you want to go to rebuttals we can larry you're more than welcome to stick around but uh now is our rebuttal period and if you want to stick around you'll get the last word you know i can stick for a few more minutes and then i'll have to go all right. What we're going Let's to do thank now, our speaker. Thank our speaker. All right. Uh, if you got rebuttals, I'd like you to go up to the front if you're here, so that we can see you and hear you on the microphone. And uh, I'll give everybody about five minutes, and then I'll, I'm going to start off with first with Ellen, and then we're going to start off with Justin, and then go to Raj. All right. And then Sid will get you. Yeah, thanks, Larry. I, Hang on, let me get the mic on. Go ahead. We thanks, can hear Larry. Uh, I didn't really, sorry, I missed the beginning. I really, I've heard good things about the Community Renewal Society. And uh, I, you know, have, I look at Chicago as kind of a, like a Jane Adams. I came here, you know, and find that it should be a, a great laboratory for um, in implementing social reforms and progressive things. But uh, yeah, this, I don't know if this is working. No, we're, but, gonna um, pull, we're gonna pull this up. The one, the thing that disappoints me, uh, I don't know how you feel about this college of complex. Just, just, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you know, that this free speech, uh, I feel like, 
you know, like you, you come here and talk and people are just challenging just the idea of being the moral imperative of being, um, you know, anti-racist. Um, and so I, I just see that we are really kind of divided and atomized and the media is putting us in conflict. But the, so the biggest issue that I want to talk about that it's impossible to get anything on is this, the research I've done that shows that the that viruses were manufactured in laboratories and vaccines, they're, they're Nazi bioweapons. And that's the fact. They were designed particularly to kill black and brown people. And they affect our brains and our organs. And, and you know, so these issues, because there's been divided in the media that, you know, it's only kind of the plays to Fox News and it plays on, you know, um, the Florida race and Trump. So when you say this, people say, oh, you're QAnon, you're, you're an anti-Semitic neo-Nazi if you think that's a problem. I, it's, it's so concerning to me because I studied to be a teacher, um, I, you know, and the philosophy of education just ran on the idea that people, we are scientifically uh, committed to growth. And if we, unless we can admit that actually there is an invisible Nazi fascist empire that we're living in and talk about that, uh, I it just, I don't know what, we're, what we can do, you know? Um, I don't know, but it's so, you know, the one, Thing I, we need to get behind people. We need to have coalitions. People like, and I don't know why you can't talk about politics because if the FOP is endorsing Paul Vallis and you know undermining you know all the parties, so it, it seems that the way the rules have been written, it hurts the, the genuine Democrats and human humanists and people, teachers, black people, white people, women gay people, you know, we are all going by the rules and really there's this invisible Nazi uh, culture led by the police, the invisible <laughs> secret police. Charlie actually being one, if you know, um, COINTELPRO, uh, the FBI, the CIA, um, you know, they, they kind of bring people like you in, but yet we can't really come together. You know, we can't, I can't talk about Birch, the John Birch uh, torture reality. So people are uninformed. He actually brought up for the guy to be on the police council, community council, a person who didn't know who John Burge was. And, um, you know, and it was kind of awkward for the guy, because why don't they bring up me who has studied it, who's committed to taking it? We have to take on evil, you know, and it's hidden, the invisible secret police. They brought Barbie and Nazi, uh, you know, the money. So I'm going to Atlanta on the, the last weekend, there's going to be a legal group working on bringing the, the truth. It's a truth like 9-11, you know, like AIDS, like like the virus. That, uh, we need to have a truth from our government about the fact that they're, they are killing us. Okay, uh, Justin, you're next for the rebuttal. All right, Justin, you go next. All right. So, uh, thanks, uh, Larry. Um, I, I came in a little late, but, uh, thanks for answering my questions. I, I, um, I'm just going to strongly disagree with communism being or socialism or, or anything being a model for how we can, uh, get a model society. Uh, the thing about socialism is that, and communism is, since there's central planning and whatnot, it causes pro. You don't know what prices are, and therefore you don't know how much. There's no signals to tell you how much you have. Therefore, you have, you know, shortages and and mismanaged. You have mismanagement. You have famine. And uh, time and time again, this happens. This, that uh, that this has been tried. And if your if your aim in society is to create pro prosperity and to um, uplift people from poverty, the best way to do it 
is through free markets. Now, I, I certainly don't agree that America is purely a free market place. I think we need more of it. But certainly socialism and communism is not the way to go. Um, you know, the sectors, if, if you look at if you look at products and, you know, over time, they get cheaper and cheaper, except for where there is heavy government involvement. So, the, you know, for example, to say that we have a free market or, you know, capitalist healthcare system is is complete bunk. Uh, I mean, there's so much third party involvement and in, in, in Medicare and Medicaid is just such a big chunk of 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 the industry that I don't think that you can can make that claim uh, with accuracy. Uh, you know, we used to be able to know how things cost, you know, going to we used to know how much it costs to go to a doctor, you know, letting the insurance companies and the government kind of rig the system we have now is is certainly not a capitalist system and it's socialism is certainly not the answer to replace just bad policy we need to free the healthcare industry we we need to free uh you know markets in america to bring real prosperity and and you know how many people been lifted up for poverty in the past 30 years like it's, you know, it's insane. It's, 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 I just don't understand how, though, how well intentioned people can, can fall for this sort of uh, stuff. The best way to get people out of poverty is to have them work and to give them skills. It's not to make them cattle in a socialist scheme. Um, and and time and time again, we've seen the failures of this. And and I I don't I'm a little suspect of the epistemological uh, methods into knowing whether or not Cuba's healthcare industry is better than the United States. Um, I I really don't think we can take you know uh, unless I go there and see it myself. I'm I'm not going to trust much. Um, regarding the College of Complexes, though, I think it's quite hilarious and funny that the CIA or the FBI or whatever would pay Charlie overtime to host the College of Complexes week in and week out uh, we, <laughs> uh, to, to uh, infiltrate left-wing movements and report them back to the government. And certainly the file on Ellen Corley is really thick. Thanks to Charlie's sleuthing skills here, I can understand. <clears throat> uh, All right, let's go on. All right, let's <laughs> let's let's try to keep no personal attacks out of this. But we know you're trying to get some comedy. All right, are you done, Justin? Um, I also want to say that <clears throat> that I I uh, you know the College of Complexes is a great institution in Chicago that. Um, needs to continue and i think that there's ways that we can continue to improvement tim does such good work uh with his technology uh i i just tim there's there's easier ways to do it we can figure this out and uh you know um hopefully you know I, yeah i would love to see the college go on for another you know like 70 years so uh you know charlie does good work with the programming we maybe there i i would you know there's got to be something that's going to happen, you know, when these two guys retire. There's going to be a uh, uh, a void to to fill, and and certainly we need to be thinking about raising the next generation of people to uh, continue Charlie's legacy of spying on uh, left wing dissidents in Chicago through the institution of the of uh, the College of Complexes. So thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Tim, for all your good work. And, and to all the regulars that I've known throughout the years, okay. uh, you guys, you know, it's been great to meet you guys. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, thanks. I guess okay. that would be well, our speaker just left. I'm going to, I forgot who was next. Is that you, I'm Raj? Next. I'm next. Okay, Raj, go ahead. Okay. The, I, I, unlike, unlike this, unlike this speaker. I have a great hope for a black community. I always had a great hope for a black community because uh, since I came, I've been seeing black people going up and up and up 
in economically, in a society, in a education, in a jobs, in a politics, they're doing better and better and nobody can, nobody can refuse that. And uh, I think black community has a great future because uh, look at Brendan Johnson. I mean, it's a, it's, it requires lots of guts and lots of courage and uh, he has paid his due. He comes from a good family and uh, he, he has a good idea and he did a good job at a teacher's union. And uh, he has a good idea about uh, how, uh, how to improve our education, how to improve our police department. And uh, I think he can do it. We, we, we have Barack Obama, you know, he came out of nowhere and nobody counted him to anybody, but he became a great president. He's a better president than, than probably we have currently. The, the great thing is that, that uh, blacks are, blacks feel that they are being discriminated, but there's a smaller and smaller community that feels like they're within black community. More and more are willing to go on and uh, deal, with the, deal with the reality, deal, adjust the situation, adjust with the white people, adjust with their thinking, you know, white people are less and less discriminatory. You know, in the building I live in, there are 200 apartments. When I came, uh, the, there was no black. 10 years later, I, I had a party, I invited a black guy, and uh, they, they come to the building, they, I budge them in inside, and they don't, I don't see them, and they go away. I call them, and they say, well, you know, they're all white people and black, they see a black man, they call the police and I get stuck. I didn't want to stay there. And it doesn't happen now. Now we, we, have, a, we have lots of black tenants in a building and that's a change. See, and I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I think speaker, it comes out more socialist and come out looking at a more poor people and poverty than success. And uh, community to succeed, they have to look for people who succeed people are going ahead, who are becoming engineers, doctor. I, my, my doctor's office, there are two black doctors. You know, few years ago, they, they were not there and they are now. It's so my, my dentist, dentist I go, they have a black, black uh, what do you call it? Uh, the black, those who take taste and everything. And they're pretty sophisticated, pretty smart. I go to grocery store, there are blacks there. I go to, any place I go, and there are black employees are there. There's a progress. North side, we see lots of black employees. Walmart, when started taking black employees, in the beginning, we had lots of problems because they were not well trained. Now they're well trained and they are doing very well. So the our speaker is wrong. And I hope black community don't think like that, like him. And I hope black community thinks more like Brendan Johnson. You know, and I don't think I don't think uh, I trust Wallace. And I think Wallace is racist. And unfortunately, my elder man is uh, gone that way. But Maria Hayden, girls, I, I have known her for, since uh, Robert Blaw introduced me to her. And uh, I'm so impressed in everything, running her word. She's the most communicative, most um, talking to her, her, her people and doing very well. She got elected 75% of the vote. So that means her ward likes him, her. Thank you. That I, I'm done. Hello, I'm done. Thanks. Uh, all right, I'm gonna get Sid from over here. We will. All right, go ahead, Sid. Uh, let me to try to use the, uh, let me get you. Go ahead. Um, Loud if you can, please. If you look at any country, there is class divide. And some people <laughs> in that society have trillions of dollars, if not millions of dollars. And some people don't have a pot of history.
We have no sound. <laughs> Looks like uh, Tim completely. Oh, here we go. He's getting back online. About other culture and not to be. Not to be uh, fooled by the fact that somebody has a black skin, somebody has a white skin. If you lived in Africa, if you didn't have a black skin, you would die. Because according to Darwin, it's it's um it's the selection of the people that were darker that lived. So it has nothing to do with the brain. It has everything to do with the climate. But in the United States, they use that black power to say people are inferior and don't deserve the same rights as white people or even Latin people are doing. So it's a scapegoat. And if they want to blame somebody, they're not going to blame themselves. They have to have a scapegoat. And that's what it's about. Scapegoating people so they can make more money. And the more they get, the more they want. And it starts war. There's constant wars in the United States. We're in, been in constant war since the end of World War II in Africa, in Asia, in, in the Middle East. Constant wars. Why? Wars make money for people. If you destroy a tank, you have to replace it. So the big. The last year, at least 10 years. So people are not going to buy a car every half hour. But they'll buy a new tank every half hour. So they make money off of war. This is, this is not a decent society. This is a society that eventually has to be done away with. It's a far slavery. And who wants to be a slave? The people don't realize they're slaves. So they say, oh, this is free enterprise. Free enterprise left the United States over 100 years ago. It's monopolies that control it. Monopolies that control the television, the radio, the newspaper. It's people with a lot of money. And you want to make more money. Okay. Send me for president. Yeah. No. All right. Who's next? Go ahead. You want to get up there and speak at the mic? Grab the mic and put it on the podium. All right. Encore. Encore. All right. Just take it up to the podium and set it right there. We'll get you, David. First of all, Sid's indictment. He forgot to include that the Native Americans have also been the targets for all kinds of discrimination and hatred. Louder and scandalous. I'll, I'll get it on here. Go ahead. Sid neglected to mention that Native Americans 
Awesome. We can't hear you. Can I hear you at all? Go ahead. Just, just speak loud, okay? Then neglected to mention that Native Americans have also been scapegoats, most of the same kind of abuse that he was talking about. The second, I find laughable the idea that Charlie, with whom I've had many differences, and undoubtedly have many more, is, a, is some kind of a tool of the CIA. FBI. Whatever. He told me he was. Yeah. Wow. One fool at a time. If, if he is, the FBI and the CIA are not getting very much for their money. <laughs> you know what? Thank you. Uh, Oh, what's up? Well, you've got Justin and well, this other guy to help him. Too. Well, uh, the police over. aren't working for the people. They're working for the state. That's what we don't understand. Who's working for the state again? The police. The police are working for the state. They're protecting the rich what's monopoly that? police state. You know, that? they're not working. They don't protect. No, she doesn't get two. She doesn't get two rebuttals tonight. No way. Yeah, come on, Tim. Give us our order. Yeah, who is that? Uh, That's Justin. Oh, yeah. Are you guys paid or what? Undercover part of the co-ed? Actually, bottle, please. For you. Is that what the glasses and all this is? I mean, because the hate is there. You're a hate group, obviously. Hey, no, you only get one rebuttal, lady. The whole point is to be hateful. That's the only thing. One full at a time, please. Order, 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 order. order. You already had your turn. You already had your turn. Order, 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 order. All right, I'd like to offer a few comments based on some stuff that a bunch of people said. Um, the presenter today, um, he's just a standard hard leftist who's using race as a vehicle to get his leftist policies enacted. Um, I, I think one clue at a time. One clue at a time. Okay. Yeah, just go ahead. Be um, I didn't interrupt you. Okay, so he's just using his, he's just using race as a vehicle to get his hard left policies enacted. Um, I was disappointed in his answer to my question about nearly half of black people thinking it's not okay for whites to say that it's okay to be white. Uh, it seems that uh, black people have a very heavy bias against white people, but this uh, Larry guy seems not to have a problem with that, which is uh, unfortunate. He says it's a it's a small problem, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that if it was the other way around, I hate to be cliche with shoe on the other foot analysis, but if it was on, if it was the other way around and it was a poll that showed half of white people didn't think it was okay to be black, that people like him would be marching in the streets over and over because of white racism or something like that. I'm sure that's something that he would be doing. Um, he uses the term Latinx. Um, even Latinos, Hispanics, whatever is the correct term, I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, so whatever the correct term that they prefer, that's what I like to use. But I know for a fact that that term is not Latinx. Latinx is a woke uh, construction of uh, academics, and there's, there's data that shows that it's in the single digits that Latinos actually support the use of Latinx. What Latinx is, is, it's an attempt to strip out gender from an inherently gendered language in order to make the gender non-binary and all other kinds of woke demographics feel more comfortable by not having to fit into Latino or Latina, for example. Um, Latinx is just ridiculous. Um, I, I as a meta point about uh, college complexes and Zoom and everything, um, it, I would just make a humble request that anybody who comes in and is admitted into the, when, when Tim admits people in, please be muted. Like, it's really disruptive, and, and, and I'm, I'm specifically going to call out Raj. I like him, but like he, his, his microphone was noisy as soon as he came in. And we had to spend like a couple minutes getting Larry back online because we had to mute Raj and everything. So everybody who comes in through Zoom, please be muted. It's just polite and respectful. It's, it's, it's not disruptive. Um, this idea of scapegoating, 
you know, like blacks are inferior and that's scapegoating or something like that. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what all the deal is behind that, but the idea that there aren't differences, group differences between people, such as, for example, personality characteristics, or dare I say, intelligence. Uh, the idea that there aren't group differences is patently absurd. Even, even lefty Sam Harris in a podcast uh, with Charles Murray acknowledges that the data on group differences in intelligence is robust. It's not, it's, we're not all blank slates. Steven Pinker talked about the blank slate and how that's a myth. We're not all blank slates. It's not all social forces and systemic oppression that causes disparities in outcomes. Some disparities in outcomes are due to disparities in the ability and talent. Is there is no way around it? Is there is there racism? Are there obstacles? Sure, there are, but I think it's overblown by guys like this Larry guy who, who just presented. Um, I think I, I also really just like um, it seemed like one of the things that Larry was really focused on what white people need to do. White people need to really look within themselves and all this stuff, and it's like, uh, no thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with what I think. I'm fine with how I think. I don't need to do introspection to find out, like, do I have deep secret hidden racism or whatever he's thinking we all need to do, like there's a burden on us. Um, he never did answer my question about, uh, um, you know, the, the poll results of uh, <coughs> black people thinking it's not okay to be white. Um, I wonder for a guy like Larry, if this police accountability stuff that he's talking about, if, that, if that's only like, local and municipal police or if he's also talking about like federal police like cia fbi any of the various agencies that have enforcement arms like the irs the general police does he does he want to see those things reformed or is it only local police and he wants to preserve all the nice special powers that all these federal police have i don't know uh that's that's what i'd like to to know and i you know there's a couple of books that I haven't gone through, but I think they're probably going to be interesting. Um, I have a book here. It's There's an introduction by Jared Taylor. It's called A Dissident Guide to Blacks and Africa. And also there is a book edited by Samuel Francis, uh, Race and the American Prospect, uh, Essays on the Racial Realities of Our Nation and Our Time. Uh, these books were hard to get, but I suspect that they're going to be well worth it. If they're not, I will report on that at some future time. Thank you. Okay, Raj, you, well, you're next. Go ahead. I think I think uh, if uh, Larry was something, Justin is one of the character I found here in this place. Then normally I don't like to talk to him because uh, just he doesn't understand what what America is or what our world is. He has a, his own fantasy, and uh, he you know. But uh, Larry represents a part of the black community who are a uh, little less well off and uh, people who haven't adjusted within their own community and uh, they have less education often and uh, they are stuck in a black community and uh, do not have any rapport with other community like Justin doesn't have you know, any understanding of other communities. And uh, th there are lots of white people do not have their understanding. And uh, our election coming up, uh, a runoff election between may on mayors, and it's, it shows very clearly that uh, some, one group doesn't have understanding of other group. And uh, some people can never, never understand that uh, Brendan Johnson can be a mayor. And uh, somebody like me don't understand that Paul Wallace could be a mayor with all kind of record he has and all kind of goof up he has and his lack of understanding of the ordinary people. Oh. He's there for people. He, he just, he just what do you call it, a consultant. He just worry about getting the results. And there is, there is no iota, yeah. there is no iota of uh, human understanding human being understanding a humanity or caring for people, understanding people. Larry, the, the, the Wallace legend have the, that, that particular character. And I think he's unfit to be mayor of the Chicago because uh, you like, he will unleash the police on the black community. He will unleash the 
only the police on a, and and we will have a, lots of riots and lots of uh, you know it's just just like a Emmanuel Emmanuel did Emmanuel did not care for black people and that was the reality and that you cannot wipe it out or cannot correct it or cannot whitewash it I mean he was nasty he did not care for it and uh, that was a sad thing and I don't want to go back to that particular kind of character. In, a, in, a, in Chicago. We can work it out differently. Black community is coming up very well, thank you. There are lots and lots of black communities seeing everywhere. And a white community and black community are living with each other. I see in my own building, I see my own neighborhood, that they are doing well, okay? And a guy like Justin, who is racist, sexist, whatever he is, but he doesn't understand, and he never understand, and I care less. But Chicago has a better future. And with Brendan Johnson, we'll have a better future. In a Paul Wallace, he'll create racism, sexism, and uh, other, other kind of problem, and we do not need him. Thank you. OK. All right, I'm going to go next here. All right. OK, here we go. Next year, we'll leave. OK, now. I want to call out our guys who keep blasting America, who say that capitalism doesn't work, who says that we're nothing but an oppressive state. I concur that nothing could be further from the truth. And I start right away with quoting from our very Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created with certain inalienable rights. Amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, here, here. And the thing that I really have to get upset about is when you look at the 1619 Project, they say that America was based on racism. I can see nothing further from the truth. Although slavery was a part of the institution for the first hundred years, we fought a bloody civil war to get rid of it. And then another hundred years of Jim Crow to get rid of it. Finally, in the 60s, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and other reforms, we were able to acknowledge our sins and move forward. Now, as far as American capitalism is concerned, yes, there have been some problems with monopolies. Yes, there have been some things, but there's also been a string of reforms over the last 150 years, amongst which was Teddy Roosevelt with the passage of the Antitrust Act. And uh, now, again, we're starting to see a little bit of the thing go back to um, parity. We need to get that enforcement of the Antitrust Act back up to break up some of these large monopolies. Did you realize that Google and Facebook and these other large monopolies are here? But did you realize that most of these companies are less than 15 years old or 20? And they were able, because of this new technology of the That's internet, to uh, move forward. You know, it ain't, it ain't like a media controlled world where we get our news from three distinct networks like it was when I grew up. You can find anything almost anywhere, including the free propaganda you can hear from Russia, including the propaganda you can hear from Iran, and maybe some of it in America too with Fox News. But I can tell you one thing, you can hear the viewpoints. All you have to do is click on your web browser and search, and you'll be able to get the other side. You could still pull in Russian television, too, as a matter of fact. Over the years. It's a little harder now with some of the breakdowns, and even now with some of the censorship on YouTube and its algorithm, you can go to places like BitChute, like other, other things, and still get your videos and messages out there. I don't agree with these anti-vaccine people, but I do know they've got a right to speak and let them speak. No, that's bullshit. Uh, Charlie, full at a time, Charlie, uh, Charlie you've got to have all views. One full at a time. Yeah, people get harmed. One full at a time. Because you don't have free speech. One full at a time, people. Charlie. One full at a time. No, I've got to tell one you right like, now. Um, one full at a time. Somebody gets harmed. There are limits to One full at a time. It is my cat constitutional conviction. That capitalism is the best way to produce wealth, it's the best way to develop, and it's unfortunate right now that we're starting to see the 
decoupling of globalization and our supply chains because that means the rest of the world is going to start losing their each country will start losing its expertise adam smith in his book called the wealth of nations was able to with globalization and free trade be able to bring prosperity for all we witnessed it in the early 2010s when america was asleep with terrorism we saw the rise of China and India, the equivalent of three United States. And they were starting to prosper. It's too bad now that uh, they're starting to embrace this socialistic and uh, communistic models of control. And it's unfortunate too that we had a last president who had some dictatorial tendencies. And I hope the next election is not a rerun, but a hopefully a true thing. I believe in America. I believe in its systems. I believe in free enterprise. I believe in democracy. I, I believe in plantation system. Resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Man, boy, I believe in plantations. Charlie, do you want to be oh, me or not? Yeah, I do. Oh, All right, Charlie, we're gonna going too. All right. I find it singularly amazing that somebody like Tim could listen to a guy talk about poverty in this nation and then get up and say there isn't any. I, I would, would, were you in another room or off someplace in space? He spoke at length on the conditions that were not well under capitalism. And his organization exists to try to correct that. I heard during the, during the discussion, I was singularly amazed that some of you didn't understand a term, it's actually an adjective called socio-economic, S-O-C-I-O dash E-C-O and O-M-I-C. I use that term all the time. The term of art, meaning where you find yourself in a particular society, the status you, you have in a particular society determines the economics, meaning poor people are, and rich people are divided here. There's complete distinction in this nation. The disparity is growing worse, not getting better. That is not a system that works. It has not worked for minorities. That gentleman outlined. And they tried to say that since 1690, it has not worked for black people. It obviously has not. To say that it works, is, is the denial of any facts whatsoever. Um, now, the other thing is, um, I heard some arguments that um, we should not have socialism because they have poor records regarding human rights. The socialism that would be implemented in the United States would not be the same socialism that you find anywhere else. It's going to work this, this time, has huh, Charlie? A record of civil ro human rights unparalleled in the world, and the implementation of socialism does not mean that those sentiments and that case law would be discarded. Absolutely, categorically not. Now, each of those countries has their own history, which is fine. The capitalism, you are punished. For those who don't go along with capitalism, there's no punishment. You tell me there's no debtor prison. If you don't comply with the rules of re regulations of capitalism, what happens to you? You are confronted with starvation and homelessness, lack of shelter altogether. You are denied food, clothing, and shelter. There is coercion whatsoever to comply. 
And hey, you're, who you're telling denied, me people, who's denied, people, uh, do not, people in the United States do suffer. You deny that people in the United States do not suffer from a lack of food, clothing, and shelter. Now, you, I don't test, deny that, Charlie. We're talking about medicine. Just in one fall at a time, please. Yeah. Uh, the I want to tell you a story about my neighbor. Here we have a capitalist medicine. His wife got sick, was in the local hospital to drink beer with this guy. And he was moving to Arkansas. And I said, Why are you moving? His wife, the pair, I don't know his insurance situation, but they had an enormous bill from the hospital, Mercy Hospital. He actually was picking up and moving to Arkansas to try to remain achieve some sort of anonymity in hiding, which isn't going to work. But it was only the recourse we have. If you don't have money for a doctor's appointment on your capitalist system, you do not get one. You may get one if you don't pay the bill. There are no obligation to give you another appointment. That's a system that men's correction. If that's the, the best we can do in terms of interpersonal relationships, Illness is not a matter of choice. It is a matter of circumstance. And people get illness and they need care, they need treatment. However, the, 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 if you get treatment at all under capitalist system, it's based in, if you cannot afford medicine, you go to the drugstore, if you can't afford it, they don't give it to you. I'm not aware of that ever happening. They happen. So let's put an end to this. If we have a social implementation of socialist arrangements here, it can fully incorporate the body of human rights uh, statutes that we have permanently enforced. And there's no reason whatsoever that those would be discarded. So you can tell me all these stories of history, stay up all night, reading history books, and then I don't particularly sir, see the relevance. All right. So that's basically it. Um, I'm sorry to say that now Tim says capitalism is okay, but it needs a little, little refinement. Now, why isn't it by design okay? If you say, what do you want to do? And you submit a plan. But the plan has internal flaws. Why do it? Get another plan. Another plan. We are no no obligation to accept a plan with flaws. Well, Charlie, even though capitalists we are under no obligation to, all the others. to accept a plan that incorporates within it flaws, mistakes, things that are not correct, and so forth. And we're supposed to pretend that they don't. Anyhow, that's all. Thanks for coming. It actually turned out to be a real good evening, I think. Thank all you. All right, Andy, you're here next. You're next, Andy, go ahead. Yeah, but you were a little bit li liberal tonight, so. Uh... You know, I mean, you, you got your, you got your, uh, oh no, I turned it off because there was some static interference. I, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the microphone itself. It was actually the box. I got another box at home and I'll, I'll bring some other speakers I've been wanting to try anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, the static's coming from the, it's, it's on now, yeah. Okay. Um, let me uh, get rid of Charlie's spotlight here. Okay. All right. And if you see the microphone, they can hear you fine on Zoom. So. Okay. And I'll I'll I got a clock. So go ahead. Uh, I'd like to make a few comments uh, to fill in. I think our speaker tonight did an excellent job of uh, describing a lot of the the problems that we face in America and. Uh, How many people remember Kelly Savalas who played a character called Kojak way back in the 70s? Kojak, at the end of one of his famous sayings was, 
you know, as he's walking away, he says, when is society ever going to learn that where you have no justice, you get violence? Where you have no justice, you get violence. People won't die quietly. And when they... See, um, when you come out of high school in Chicago, what's different now versus about 60 years ago is I have a lot of people my age that are retired can say, when I got out of school, I can walk down the street and get a job in any factory. If you were willing to work, you'd get a job. Those jobs aren't in Chicago. They're in foreign countries. Kid walks out of high school today, especially in the African-American neighborhoods. He's got two choices. Go in the military or join a gang and start selling drugs. Because there are basically no other jobs for able-bodied young black people because the factories aren't here. The buildings have been leveled or converted to condos or something else. The jobs sufficient to support young people that would want to support themselves without a life of crime, those jobs don't exist in any appreciable numbers in Chicago, period. Inequality, there's all kinds of books on showing that Tom Hartman talks about this all the time. The greater gap of inequality between the rich and the poor, the more violence you have in society. Inequality breeds violence. And to say that our capitalist system has a few problems is kind of like saying that, well, other than a few minor problems in Germany and Poland, there was nothing going on during the 1940s. <laughs> other than other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was your trip to Dallas? <laughs> <laughs> this country has the greatest welfare system on the planet. I'll say that again. This country has the greatest welfare system the world has ever seen. We're running a system of welfare for billionaires. And sooner or later, one of them is going to be a trillionaire. We are shoveling money to billionaire predators who act like sharks, getting bigger and bigger, and they just eat everything in sight. And that's sharks. economic. We're, 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 in, we're seeing economic warfare in America, a war on the middle class and the poor. By by the super rich. Since 1980, I already mentioned that, you know, when Ronald Reagan was elected, the rich people had decided in 1973 with the Powell memo, Supreme Court Justice Powell put out a memo that says, rich people, corporations have to develop their own media. They have to start fighting back. We can't have a middle class of people thinking that they have the same rights as the super rich. We have to start taking it back. And all kinds of studies show that the average wage worker today makes about the same in inflated dollars as he made in 1970, while the, the, the billionaires have shot through the roof. Their latest studies, uh, more than one, show there's no county in America, no county in America anywhere that you can rent and live indoors in a one-bedroom one apartment on a, on a minimum wage job. Minimum wage is the way the minimum wage is about a third of what you need to get out of a homeless shelter and rent and pay, pay for gas and oil, even if you own a 10 year old car, no car payments. There's a book on nickel and dime called that. Who is that? Barbara Aaron. Barbara. Yeah. Oh, for those of you, here's a tidbit that I just heard. For those of you that didn't know about Ron, did you know Ron DeSantis was part of the torture program at Guantanamo Bay, tor torturing uh, people uh, around 2006, 2007 during the Bush administration? That's just one of the things in Ron DeSantis's background that nobody's talked about. Okay. When you talk about police, police brutality, I don't want to defund the police any more than. Uh, I would just want to be fun to get rid of Catholic, you know, all churches. That's okay, Andy. The, uh, the police nationwide have a problem like the Catholic Church had a problem with pedophile priests. But the Catholic Church at least is being forced to do something about it, where the police are harboring people, or maybe, maybe it's 6%, maybe it's 5%. There's a core of people in the police departments that like to kill black people. 
you just have to say it that way. They, and they see their their uh, their ancestors, their, their their fathers and uncles were cut off. You can't lynch people in trees anymore. 1965, we reached critical mass. Of, we don't want to see people hanging in trees anymore. So they have these policemen saying, I fear for my life. If I had to pull out my gun, I blew them away. Uh, that's what it's all about. And also 9-11 plays a, a tremendous role in this. 9-11 is the poisonous tree that was planted. So we were attracted and attacked by Muslims. Okay, Muslims are evil. Now we go send send people over to Afghanistan and Iraq, soldiers. They're used to killing anything that moves. Didn't freeze up. He's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> 